and welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and I have hit 30,000 subscribers, which means it's time for another 10 Deck Ideas video. And as with all the other videos I've done so far like this, these are basically just deck ideas that I came up with, or maybe even other people came up with that I thought were interesting for you guys to run with. There are no deck lists here. However, for all of you who have been watching my channel, you know I have a Building Janky Commander Decks series that I am using a lot of the ideas from these videos to do that. So if I get a lot of requests for any of these ideas, and I will put a poll in the description below for you guys to vote on which one you want to see, I'll actually go ahead and build that deck in my janky commander decks series so let's get started with what i'm calling partner without okay and what that means is you're using a partner commander without another partner and i know people will say well that's not original at all. a lot of people have been doing that there's tons of just Thrasios decks that are only Thrasios and no one else. However, I would like to go a step further here though and go with the partner with commanders, right? The commanders that specifically want to partner with another creature, right? Like Kazur, who wants to partner with Okima, or Haldan, which wants to partner with Paco. Only build the one, right? Only go with one of the partners rather than both. I think that makes for a pretty interesting build around. I've done this myself already. I've encouraged some of my patrons to do it as well, and they've built some partner without decks that they're really happy with. So you have Nakara and Yannick, for example, right? They partner with each other, but you're only going to take one. You're only going to take Nakara and build that deck just around her or you're going to build a deck just around Yannick and I know people say well why would you ever do this when you can have both of them access to more colors you get the advantage of both commanders I find that if you just focus on what one of those commanders is doing you really can get a lot more value out of what that specific commander is doing because you will be a lot more focused Moving on to number two is false hug. And false hug basically means, you know, I'm hugging, I'm playing a hug deck, everybody, but not really, right? And there's a couple of different strategies you can go with this. You can go with, first of all, a, I want my opponents to gain life strategy, but I'm actually gonna use it to kill you, right? So you can use cards like False Cure or Tainted Remedy where I'm gonna get my opponents to gain a bunch of life, but then it's gonna end up doing them damage. Cavu Predator is another interesting way you can use this where whenever an opponent gains life, you put that many plus one, plus one counters on Cavu Predator. And if you happen to be playing against a deck that's gaining life, and there's lots of those out there already, this is all just gonna be upside for you anyway, right? It's gonna be added bonus. Another strategy you could go is I wanna punish my opponents for drawing cards. A Sizan deck is typically going to be doing that. I did that on my Underwhelming Commander series already. Malignant Growth is another card that I talked about in my 10 cards videos, which is sort of this sneaky card. And this is sort of the strategy where you're sort of enticing your opponents to do stuff, but then you're punishing them for it. So Malignant Growth is going to let your opponents draw more cards, which they will like, but then it's going to deal them damage as well. But because they're drawing cards, they're kind of going to be okay with it, right? That's why the strategy works really well. Another strategy that works here is the show and tell tempting worm strategy where you entice your opponents to put stuff into play for free, right? You go, hey, everyone gets to put a huge creature or an enchantment into play for free. And then of course you're gonna destroy it all, right? This is actually a pretty good strategy. If someone puts their best creature from their hand immediately into play, and then on your turn, you cast a farewell and exile everybody's stuff that they just cheated into play, that's huge advantage for you, right? Like I say all the time about board wipes, they get better and better and better the more stuff you're gonna hit with them. It's huge card advantage for you. And the added bonus here is it's a false hug, right? Your opponents think that you're actually trying to help them. You could even use Feldegrift as your commander if you want to be sneaky about it and make your opponents think that that's what you're doing when really your hidden strategy here is to basically kill them with their own greed, right? Which I think is kind of extra good about this strategy is where you're making your opponents pay for their own greed. While we're talking about Feldegrift, how about a Feldegrift deck that isn't hug, right? This is something you don't see very often. People just automatically build their Feldegrift decks as Hog. I played against the Feldegrift deck in the early days of playing this format and the guy was not playing a Hog deck. I had seen like three or four Feldegrift decks already. They were all Hog. I don't find that particularly interesting or fun to play against. This guy wasn't playing a Hog deck. He was actually playing a Feldegrift deck that was taking advantage. He was using his commander's abilities to give himself advantage. He was actually trying to win with it. So for example, he'd give his opponents Hippo tokens and then he would take advantage of the fact that his 
opponents have lots of creatures, right? That's one way you can go about it. Basically, the idea here, though, is take a commander that is typically always used for one thing and use it for something completely different, right? So it doesn't have to be Feldegrift. I had a guy said Oscar Landfall. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the strategy is there. I guess you could use Artifact Lens maybe, but that's an interesting one, right? You take a commander that is almost entirely used for one strategy and then use it for something completely different. I had an interesting idea for Atraxa Voltron. That's not even that fringe, I don't think. Atraxa is a fantastic creature. That's what makes her such a great commander. I mean, yeah, the proliferate's great, but the fact that she's got flying, death touch, lifelink, and vigilance is pretty fantastic. How many people have actually tried to build a Voltron strategy with that? I actually think it wouldn't be that difficult and it would work really, really well. And then on top of that, there are Voltron pieces that are going to benefit from the proliferate as well. So basically the idea here is take a commander that is typically built in a very one-dimensional way and go a completely different strategy with it. Coming in at number four is Spy King. It. And this is an idea that is, I think, has been floated around quite a bit. I actually have a patron who has a spy kit deck. And the idea is to give the equipped creature the same name as all non-legendary creature cards in addition to its name. So it has the same name as everything else. And the reason you do this is because it works really good with same name stuff. A couple of my favorite combos here are Cornered Market. Two and a white enchantment. Players can't cast spells with the same name as a non-token permanent. So once you put the spy kit on one of your creatures, basically no one can play creature spells, right? It just prevents people from playing spells with that name and your creature has the same name as every non-legendary creature. Bizarre of Wonders is another really funny one that I found. Three blue blue world enchantment when Bizarre of Wonders enters the battlefield, exile all graveyards. I mean, okay, good graveyard hate card, I guess. Also though, whenever a player casts a spell, counter it if a card with the same name is in a graveyard or a non-token permanent with the same name is on the battlefield. So again, if you put the spy kit on your creature, now no Nobody can cast creature spells or it will get countered. It still allows your opponents to cast their commanders. It's not super oppressive. I think it's actually a pretty fun combo. You can go other ways with the same name thing though. I talked about Verdant Succession in my Ho Tao deck recently that I did on my Underwhelming Commander series. And this cares about same names too, right? Whenever a green non-token creature dies, that creature's controller may search their library for a card with the same name as that creature and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. And with Ho Tao, you can put your creature that just died on on top of your library so that it immediately goes back into play. This also works good with World Spine Worm. You can sacrifice your World Spine Worm, right? It is a green non-token creature. And when it's put into your graveyard from anywhere, it goes on the bottom of your library. So it will immediately go back into play. So if you got a sack outlet here, you can just sack it infinitely and create an infinite amount of five, five worm tokens of trample. Remembrance is another card that will actually work this way. Three and a white enchantment. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, you may search your library for a card with the same same name as that creature, reveal it and put it in your hand. So this doesn't have to be green. It can be any color. A lot of people will use this strategy in their Athreos decks with Shadowborn Apostle because whenever you sack your Shadowborn Apostle, you can go get one and put and refill your hand with it. So it works great there. And that's another way that you can use a lot of these cards, right? Is the Relentless Rats, Shadowborn Apostle. I can play more than one creature of the same name in my deck. So lots going on there that you can work with with that idea, I think. But moving on to I want my my creatures to be blocked. And this is another idea that I sort of touched on in the very, very early days of my channel. One of my very first deck decks on my channel was Gore Muldrak. For anyone who's checked out that video, and I was just trying to come up with an idea for Gore Muldrak, right? Commander Legends had just come out. I was doing deck decks with those commanders, and I thought that this idea fit with Gore Muldrak. It's not the best commander in the world for that. It's just an idea I had that I combined with that commander. But basically the idea is I have created creatures that I want to be blocked. And there are lots of creatures out there like that. Elven Warhounds is a particular favorite of mine. Whenever it becomes blocked, any creatures blocking it, you put on top of owner's library. Talorian Entrancer is a fantastic one where when it becomes blocked, you gain control of all creatures that blocked it at the end of combat. So imagine either of these creatures with a lure effect on it. The Talorian Entrancer, it will probably die, obviously, because it's going to take a bunch of damage 
but you're still going to gain control of all those creatures at the end of combat, right? You'll gain control of your opponent's entire team because they have to block with everything. The Elven Warhounds won't die. That's why I really like that creature because Elven Warhounds essentially never takes combat damage. As soon as it's assigned blockers, those blockers go on top of the library. So you can just put your opponent's entire team on top of their library and that's what they're going to be drawing for the next, you know, five or six turns. Engulfing Slagworm is another creature that just wants to be blocked because when it does, it's going to destroy those creatures and you gain life. You can do this in a Naeth deck. A, a Naeth deck will work here where you can obviously use that to force your opponents to block. Doesn't have blue though and there's a lot of really nice blue creatures that want to be blocked. That's why I would like to include blue in this strategy. Also, you don't want your creatures to be dying all the time. I thought Angus McKenzie, even though it's a really expensive card, would be a good commander for a deck idea like this because he prevents combat damage, right? We don't care about damage here. All we care about is blocking. So when we attack with our Talorian and Trancer, for example, if it becomes blocked after it's already been blocked, the trigger for our creature is going to go on the stack. It's already going to resolve. Then we can prevent combat damage. In fact, we can even prevent combat damage beforehand. As long as we have that lure effect on our Talorian and Trancer, opponents have to block. No combat damage has to be exchanged at all. Just the blocking is all what our creature cares about. And then we get to gain control of them. So there's a couple different strategies here. You can use some fog effects, right? Because again, combat damage is not important in this scenario. All we care about is blocking. And then we're going to put a bunch of those creatures in this deck that are going to want to be blocked. Coming in at number six is Nephilim Tribal. Another interesting idea I came up with, if you're not familiar with the Nephilim, they originally came out in Ravnica block. They are the first four color creatures ever made. They were the only four color creatures ever made until the C16 commanders came out. And in fact, a lot of people were using the Nephilim as commanders before that. A lot of people out there still have Nephilim decks just because they really feel like commanders. They really feel like legendary creatures. They all have very unique, interesting, very build aroundable abilities. Of course, there are five because there's one of each four color combination. And the reason I think you could probably make a deck with this, I mean, five's not a lot, but you do have a five color deck. Obviously, the deck would have to be five color in order for this to work. So obviously, a lot of tutors are available for you to go get them. And I think a great commander here is Morophon, right? Because Morophon is going to reduce the colored cost of your creatures, which means all your Nephilim are going to be free, right? They only cost colored mana. So when your Morophon's in play, you're going to name Nephilim, all your Nephilim them are now zero mana they cost nothing and then on top of that they get the plus one plus one and there are several of them in particular dune brood nephilim and glint nephilim that want to be dealing damage which i think is significant so you could go that route right dune brood nephilim when it connects is going to give you a one one colorless sand creature token for each land you control glint nephilim when it deals combat damage you get to draw that many cards and you can discard a card to pump it so that's really good your tiller nephilim also has a very powerful build aroundable ability not a deal damage ability but an attack ability whenever it attacks you return target creature card from your graveyard to play tapped and attacking and then you got witchmon nephilim which doesn't have an attack or damage thing, but clearly wants to be attacking because it's just going to be a big, scary attacker. Whenever you cast a spell, you may put two plus one, plus one counters on it. And when it attacks, it gains trample if its power is 10 or greater. So obviously you want to be attacking there. And the final one here is Ink Treader Nephilim. And this one might not seem like it actually suits. Whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, if the spell targets only Ink Treader Nephilim, copy the spell for each other creature that spell could target. Each copy target gets a different one of those creatures. The reason why this one I think could fit is because what you do is you cast pump spells, right? Just like you would in a feather deck where you cast spells that target your creatures, right? Like a shelter, for example, one on a white instant target creature, you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn, draw a card. Now I can cast the shelter on my creatures, give them protection from a certain color. Ink Treader Nephilim is only going to target the creatures that can be targeted by that spell. Shelter can only target a creature you control, so it's not going to affect your opponent creatures you give your creatures protection from some color so you can get in for damage a lot easier so i think that strategy works here as well of course the added bonus is you get to draw a bunch of cards so i think this is a very viable deck even
even though there only is five Nephilim, I just really like the idea. Plus, I like the idea of Morophon as the commander and your Nephilim all are free. I think that's pretty interesting. But moving on to number seven is I have only one creature. And I know people say, well, isn't that Voltron? Well, yes and no. I mean, it definitely, I think ultimately will be a Voltron strategy. But what people might not know is there is a surprising lot of cards in the game that care about you having exactly one creature, like Homicidal, Seclusion, and Deadly Wanderings. Both five mana enchantments, Homicidal Seclusion, as long as you control exactly one creature, that creature gets plus three, plus one, and has lifelink. And Deadly Wanderings, as long as you have exactly one creature, that creature gets plus two, plus O, oh, and has Death Touch and lifelink. So if you have one creature and both of these enchantments in play, that one creature is going to get plus five, plus one, Death Touch and lifelink. That's pretty good. And there are a few other cards like this. Demonic Rising is another one that works here. Again, another five mana black enchantment, so I'm, I'm not sure if that means anything, but at the beginning of your end step, if you control exactly one creature, create a 5-5 five, five black demon creature token flying. So this one's sort of, it's a bit of a non-bow because it's going to give you that black demon, but then you're not going to have one creature anymore, so it's then going to shut everything else off. So this, you might want to, I don't know, sacrifice the demon to some other effect or use it for something. Lone Revenant is an interesting creature that might work with this strategy. It's a three blue blue spirit 4-4 four, four with hexproof. When Lone Revenant deals combat damage to a player, if you control no other creatures, look at the top four cards of your library, put one of them in your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. That's a pretty good ability, but you have to only have Lone Revenant in play and no other creatures. And of course, if you have some of these other enchantments, it's going to get all of those bonuses. You could also go with Exalted effects as well, like Neferox, for example. Whenever Neferox Overlord Grixis attacks alone, defending player sacrifices a creature. So maybe this is an idea for a Neferox deck, because that is a commander. There are other Exalted stuff you could use here, because obviously if you have one creature, it's going to be attacking alone. Altar of the Goyf's another interesting one that works here. Five mana tribal artifact. Whenever a creature you control attacks alone, it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of card types among cards in all graveyards. So that's pretty darn good, and that'll work great in this strategy. I just think it's interesting. There is, you know, a fair amount of cards, I would say about a half a dozen, that care about you only having one creature. How you go about that, I'm not sure. This deck would have to be black for sure, maybe blue as well. Where you go with it from there is up to you guys. Coming in at number eight is I hate your graveyard. And so basically the strategy here is you don't want your opponents to have any graveyards. You do though. You need to have graveyard in order to take advantage of the stuff you're doing. Just exiling everyone's graveyard. Not much you can do there. There's a little bit, but most of the strategy comes from your opponents not having a graveyard at all. There are cards out there that can completely shut the game down if your opponents don't have graveyards like Web of Inertia or Mist of Stagnation. I've talked about both of these on my 10 cards videos in the past. Web of Inertia, two and a blue enchantment at the beginning of each opponent's combat step. That player may exile a card from their graveyard. If they don't, they can't attack you. So if they have no cards in their graveyard, they can't do this. So you just can't be attacked if your opponents have no graveyard. And miss the stagnation even better. Permanents don't untap during their controller's untap step. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player chooses a permanent for each card in their graveyard, then untaps those permanents. So again, this is why it's important for us to have cards in our graveyard and nobody else does, right? Because now we get to untap everything. No one else does. Of course, we can use Dothy Voidwalker to do this. Leyline of the Void will do this, right? We want cards that are going to exile our opponent's graveyards, but leave ours alone. You could also use targeted removal like a Nile Spellbomb or a Bajuka Bog that will exile target player's graveyard. Ultimately, it's ideal for you to have a permanent like Leyline of the Void sitting on the battlefield so that you don't have to repeatedly be doing this all the time. Bridge from Below is another great fit here. Whenever a non-token creature is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, if Bridge from Below is in your graveyard, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Well, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, whenever a creature is put into an opponent's graveyard from the battlefield, if Bridge from Below is in your graveyard, you exile it. So as soon as an opponent's creature dies, this goes away. But if you have a ley line of the voided play, there will be no creatures hitting the graveyard, at least for your opponents. So all your non-token creatures dying will be replaced by a 2-2 black zombie. And this never gets exiled from your graveyard because your opponent's creatures are never hitting the graveyard. And then, of course, you could just go with a living death, which is ultimately the best way to go this route. Each player exiles all creature cards from the graveyard, then sacrifices all creatures they control and put all cards they exiled this way on the battlefield. So, of course, this is one-sided if your opponents have no graveyard, right? Twilight's Call is another card that will do this that will return all creatures from all graveyards to play. So if your opponents 
have no graveyards, massive advantage for you and they get nothing. So a lot of ways to go with this strategy. I think it's actually a very build aroundable strategy of your opponents have no graveyards, but you do, there's lots you can do there. Coming in at number nine is changing creature types. And this one can be an incredibly powerful effect if you start doing some deep, deep research, right? So basically what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use cards like Image Crafter and Unnatural Selection to change creature types of our opponent's creatures so that we can do stuff, right? I know a lot of people out there probably have seen decks where you're changing the creature types of your creatures to get benefit out of them, right? This is more I'm changing my opponent's creatures into certain creature types to take advantage of them. One of my favorite combos here is with Spirit Mirror, two white, white enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, if there are no reflection tokens on the battlefield, create a two, two white reflection creature token. Okay, that's not bad. However, it also has pay zero to destroy target reflection and reflection is a creature type. So if you have your unnatural selection in play, you pay one mana, turn your opponent's creature into a reflection and then destroy it for zero mana. So this becomes pay one mana, destroy any creature on the battlefield. Pretty neat combo. But there's some other neat things you could do here as well. Mercenary Informer, for example. Two and a white, human, rebel, mercenary, two, one. Mercenary Informer can't be the target of black spells or abilities from black sources, but also has two and a white put target non-token mercenary on the bottom of its owner's library, right? So again, if we can change an opponent's creature type into a mercenary, now we can pay three mana and put it on the bottom of their library, which is pretty darn good. That's even better than killing it. Knight of the Mist is another interesting one. Two and a blue human knight, two, two with flanking. When Knight of the Mist enters the battlefield, you may pay a blue. If you don't, destroy target knight and it can't be regenerated. Very weird wording there. I guess the idea is, you know, you can destroy your own knight. You can destroy your knight of the mist if you don't pay the blue. But if there's another knight in play, you can destroy that knight instead. Very weird wording. But at the end of the day, in this deck, we can change an opponent's creature type to a knight. I mean, there's lots of knights in the game, so this is actually one that isn't that fringe. But if there are no knights in play, we can change that opponent's creature type to knight. When this enters the battlefield, we forego paying the one blue and we destroy that creature. I mean, who would have ever thought there was a blue knight out there that destroys other knights, right? There's lots of very interesting fringe cards like this that are targeting specific creature types. And then there's lots of other, like Amboy Changeling is another card that will change creature types. There is enough of those cards in the format. I would like to see more personal personally, but there are enough to build the deck around this idea, I think. Rashida Scalebane is another one, very fringe commander, that would be a heck of a lot better if they had more of these creature type changing effects in a colorless version. I talked about this in my three cards that the format needs. I think we need more stuff that is changing creature types to make more of these very fringe commanders a little more viable, but works great in this strategy, right? Because you can tap it to destroy target attacking or blocking dragon. It can't be regenerated. You gain life equal to its power. That's a really good ability if you can change the creature type of your opponent's creatures, right? If you can change it into a dragon, just being able to destroy it and gain life equal to its power whenever it attacks or blocks is really good. So I think this is a pretty darn viable strategy in my opinion. But getting to our last idea of the day, and it is banding. That's right. The ability banding. One of the most laughed at and made fun of abilities in the history of the game. Why the heck would I be recommending this? Well, the reason I'm recommending it is because I actually made a patron a banding deck a few months back and I did some research on it and you know, the rules have changed. Certain abilities like phasing, for example, is another one that is a really old ability where the rulings has been changed a lot on it over the years to fit with the current state of the rules. Banding is another one and to be honest, when I first started playing Magic way back, you know, a long time ago, I actually cracked open packs of Ice Age with banding creatures in it. Really had no idea how it worked. And I still don't really remember how it worked back then. But doing my research, I found that it's actually a very viable ability. So first of all, who for anyone who hasn't never seen this before, I'll explain that there are creatures that have banding. And then at the start of each combat, you can choose to band with another creature. You need one creature with banding and one creature without banding. You can make a bigger band if you have more banding creatures, but typically you're going to have one creature creature with banding, one creature without, right? You can't have more than one non-banding creature for each banding creature. Now there's a few different ways you can use banding. I'm not going to go too deep into the rules here, but I'm just going to throw out, right? This is a 10 deck ideas video. So I'm going to throw out some ideas that you can use here. First of all, if an attacking creature becomes blocked by a creature, each other creature in the same band as the attacking creature becomes 
blocked by the same blocking creature. So the reason why that's significant is now we can use that I want my creatures to be blocked idea, right? The idea I had in number five where we want our creatures to be blocked. Now the banding actually works there as well because if you band with a creature, whenever they become blocked, they're all considered blocked. So that idea sort of works. However, where I think banding is actually really good is during the combat damage step, if an attacking creature is being blocked by a creature with banding or by both, the defending player rather than the active player chooses how the attacking creature's damage is assigned. That's actually really good. The same with attacking, right? During the combat damage step, if a blocking creature is blocking a creature with banding, right? So you're attacking with your band, your opponent blocks, the active player, which is you, you're the attacker, you're the active player, rather than the defending player, chooses how the blocking creature's damage is assigned. So typically what would happen when you attack is they get to assign the damage, right? They get to assign where that damage goes. Same with attacking when you're attacking with a big creature and your opponent blocks with five different creatures you pick the creatures that your creature is going to deal damage to in a band that's not the case if you have a band you get to assign where the combat damage goes that's really really important and i think it's pretty darn good i think it works really good with a lot of combat tricks that you can get into i think it works really good again with the i want my creatures to be blocked idea where i want them to be blocked but i don't want my Talorian and trancer to take damage so i'm going to sign the damage to my other creature. I think it also works great with like a bushy tenderfoot. Again, trying to flip that guy. Now I can band with my bushy tenderfoot and instead of it getting damage and dying in combat, now it's going to survive and maybe my my creature that had the banding dies and now I can flip it. You know, it's gotten a bad name. Banding has gotten a terrible name. It's, it's sort of like a meme almost, like a joke in the game. A lot of people don't even give it any consideration at all and I actually think it's not bad. I think there's a lot you can do with banding in a sort of combat tricks manipulation sort of scenario. But that is it for today. That is 10 more deck ideas for you guys to run with. And I know a lot of people are going to be asking me to make some of these decks in the comments below. So I do have the poll. Go ahead and vote. And, you know, I might make more than a few of these, but for sure I will make the one that gets the most votes. And I'll post that in my Building Janky Deck series. So stay tuned for that. And if you actually want to play against some of these crazy casual decks, ideas. I've built some of these decks myself. My patrons have as well. We play all the time on my Discord on Spell Table. We have a blast doing it. So if you want, my Patreon link is in the description as well. You can join my Patreon, which will then give you access to my Discord. We can actually get some games in. It's always a blast. And of course, it also helps support the channel. But that is it. Thank you to all my supporters. Thank you all to my viewers, my patrons, and everybody. 30,000 subscribers feels pretty good. But that that is it for today and thanks for tuning in.